Welcome to another Juniper Sponsor Webinar. Today, our topic is the Groupon Experience, Network Automation with Python and PyEasy. My name is Robert Tang, Senior Product Marketing Manager at Juniper Networks. I'm your host. We have two distinguished guests joining us today, Nathan and Alejandro. Nathan? I'm Nathan Emery. I'm a senior consultant engineer with Juniper Networks with a primary focus on automation and cloud technologies. Hi, uh, my name is Alejandro Salinas. I'm the senior manager for network operations at Groupon. And as such, I'm responsible for everything network-wise that happens at Groupon data centers globally. We will start our webinar with Juniper's vision of an automation journey. Nathan will provide an in-depth discussion on human-driven automation, including automation toolkit for network configuration and management. This is to be followed by Alejandro, where he will share with us his network automation experience at Groupon. We'll wrap up our webinar today with some key lessons learned. Automation journey a gradual step-by-step -step process. Network automation is a journey. It is not something that you can turn on as there is no easy button that you can simply press. Our automation journey starts from human-driven automation. It started when most of our customers develop some script and or run book technology to automate device provisioning and management. They might be able to gather some network information However, it ultimately requires a human being to kick up the automation process, get information, and determine what happened next. The next stage of automation evolution is event-driven automation. Many industries, namely oil, gas, aviation, and manufacturing, have already taken steps toward event-driven automation. They compile the knowledge from respective subject matter experts from whatever industry they are in and codify it, and then use this code to automate basic manual and repetitive tasks where systems perform themselves with a little human interaction. We're taking this concept into networking where we are automating key network functions, but we are also pulling critical network information back through telemetry. We subsequently use this critical network information to create additional policy or rule-based automation. The next stage is where there are a number of Juniper team currently working on is artificial intelligence. That not only we have subject matter experts codify their knowledge into an event-driven system, but also leverage algorithm to process large amount of data from network and to deduce what needs to happen next. This is still very far off from the future, but we're working this today toward our grand vision of a self-driving network. There are multiple open source automation technology and framework in the market today. Pending your requirements, as well as stage of automation journey, each of these tools offer unique advantage and use cases. As Nathan will cover later in this webinar, the open programmability of Juniper solution can be easily integrated with these open source automation tools. Okay, Robert, thanks for that uh, overview of the evolution of automation. Uh, so now we're gonna continue on to talk about the first step of that, which is human-driven automation. Okay, so before we really dive into automation at Juniper, I think it's helpful to step back and just take a look at some of the tools and concepts involved. So what we have here is a very simple, uh, logical overview of some of the different layers and some of the different layers of abstraction that are involved here. So the way this slide is constructed, uh, it can best be thought of as an ascending order of complexity, uh, or rather a descending order of complexity, depending on how you look at it. 
at the very bottom, we have the chassis and data plane layer. Uh, obviously, this is going to be the most complex, but also the most flexible. So you can do essentially anything when you're programming at the, the PFE layer. Uh, however, we don't really necessarily want to do that from an automation standpoint. So we need some tools or libraries that simplify certain operations for us, uh, but still give us the right level of flexibility. So immediately above that, we have the XML RPC layer, which is sort of the core of Junos. Uh, and then on top of that, the rest of the tools will be built. So you'll notice that the CLI is just one application among many others, including GenoScript and uh, NetConf. Uh, above NetConf is where we really get into some of the more interesting automation tools like PyEZ, uh, Puppet, Chef, SaltStack, and so on. So Nathan, how is PyEZ related to other tools such as Puppet, Ansible, and Chef? Yeah, great question, Robert. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, Puppet, Ansible, and Chef exist at a slightly higher level of abstraction than PyEZ. Uh, so it's best to be thought of as those things uh, uh, reside directly on top of or make use of a library like PyEZ. So PyEZ is a, a Python library uh, that we provide to allow other people to build tools on top of that. Uh, and those tools can be things like Puppet, Ansible, Chef. Uh, and then, of course, the end user can then go and build additional tools on top of those tools as well. So using some of the tools that we just talked about, like Python, uh, Ansible, and so forth, um, we really want to talk about how we actually execute these scripts or these tools uh, on our, our Juniper routers or against the uh, various, you know, Juniper components. Um, so there's two separate ways that that mainly happens, namely on-box scripts and off-box scripts. So what that means is an on-box script is one that actually gets copied to the routing engine uh, inside the router, and it's actually executed either uh, on command or periodically, uh, depending on what type of on-box script that it is. Uh, and then it can carry out some actions there locally to the router. Um, so here we have a couple different types of on-box scripts, uh, commit scripts, op scripts, and event scripts. So a commit script is going to run every time a user tries to commit a, a configuration change. Um, so these are generally the ones that most people start off with when they want to implement, you know, an on-box uh, script or an on-box tool, um, because these really allow you know, a, a lot of control and a lot of flexibility around what types of configuration you will allow on the box. Uh, so a really good example of that is you could have a commit script that would say things like, if someone changes an interface, it must include an interface description. So you can have logic there that says if this candidate config or this proposed change to this router does not include an interface description, then we will not allow it due to some business rules or whatever uh, that, that exist inside your organization. So using these just small tools like commit scripts, you can really enforce consistency across all your commits. Um, so we also have things like operation scripts and event scripts. So op scripts are going to be things that are generally done on demand. Um, so you log into the router and you can uh, create an op script that can do multiple different actions for you uh, and then combine those results into a, a single sort of output. So you know, the classic example there is for, like, troubleshooting. Uh, if you have a customer issue and that customer happens to have, you know, say, a VPLS circuit uh, or maybe an L3 VPN, um, there could be multiple components involved there. So we could combine the troubleshooting steps of looking at, you know, the VPLS instance, uh, interface counters, and possibly firewall issues all in one step. So for your junior engineers or maybe your NOC staff or whomever, you can just instruct them to run a single command, and it will go look in all, you know, the logical places where you could potentially have a problem. So it kind of really reduces the burden on some of your, uh, you know, some of your operation staff. And then finally, we have event scripts. So event scripts are very much like cron jobs, for those of you who are familiar with the Unix terminology. Um, these are things that just run uh, periodically. So you could schedule these things to run, you know, every five minutes or every ten minutes, um, you know, or in response to some event that happens on the box. Um, so good examples of these are uh, we could have an event script that would take some action when it sees a log message such that, you know, um, a link goes down, right? So we see an SNMP link alarm that goes down. We see that in the uh, syslog, then we'll 
kick off some script that maybe will, you know, contact uh, some ticketing system, for example. Um, so all these very, very powerful uh, and things that can be installed directly on the box. So for latency sensitive applications, the perfect sort of application. Um, so I should also mention that these can be written uh, today in Python. Uh, and in previous versions of Juniper, these had to be written in a language called Slax. Uh, but as of 16.1 onward, uh, we do have Python support fully on box uh, with PyEZ support baked in as well. So on the other side, we have what we call off-box scripts or off-box tools. Uh, these are tools, uh, scripts, and automations and things that run outside of the router. Um, so the advantage there is you can have a central place uh, where you can run these tools that may go out and contact you know, multiple routers all at once. Um, and so typically that's done with uh, some scripting language like Perl, Python, uh, Ruby, and so forth. Uh, we provide a number of libraries to make it you know, pretty easy to get started doing that. Uh, the one we want to call out here is PyEZ. So this is the library that we've written for Python that makes it very easy to take a very Python-esque approach to manipulating you know, various objects on your routers, switches, and firewalls. Um, so PyEZ, it, it's built on top of SSH, uh, utilizes the NetConf protocol, and it allows you to do things like retrieve configuration, uh, run operational commands, um, you know, actually and, uh, do commit changes uh, to the box, uh, so on and so forth. So PyEZ is really a foundational um, product or a foundational tool that then you can build upon with some other things, as we had already mentioned, like Ansible, uh, SaltStack, and so forth. So using some of these foundational tools that we've been talking about, like Python, PyEZ, uh, the NetConf protocol, and so on, we can start to build on top of those to do some really interesting things. So one example is the Juno Snapshot Administrator, uh, which is uh, a tool we call JSnappy. So uh, JSnappy, it uses uh, Python and PyEZ uh, to contact the box to take a snapshot of the operational state of that box. Uh, so it'll capture, you know, some metrics that you may be interested in, such as number of BGP peers, um, you know, number of OSPF neighbors, uh, things of that nature. Then it, it'll take this pre-snapshot in an automated fashion, and then you can go and do some uh, uh, change to the router, like in a maintenance window or, or whatever. And then once your change is complete, uh, you want to verify that the operational state of that that router is, uh, you know, very, very close to what it was beforehand. Uh, so then we run another uh, post snapshot with a tool like JSnappy, um, which, again, will use uh, NetConf and PyEZ, Python, contact the box, uh, run a number of commands to, again, pull, you know, the new status of things like BGP neighbors, or OSPS neighbors. Um, then it will compare that with your pre-snapshot, and they give you a nice reporting output. So the end result is we can take some of these technologies and start to build tools that are, you know, much, much easier for the operator. So now you can see that your change, uh, you know, was, was completely successful and that, you know, the change actually ran, your router came back up, uh, you can still get to it, uh, so that's all good. But more importantly, all the functions that that router provides, like BGP peering or OSPF, uh, you know, neighbors and whatnot, all of those things have returned to an operational state as well, and it would save you, you know, untold number of hours because now you no longer have to, you know, manually go through and verify all 45, you know, sessions or up, things of that nature. Thank you, Nathan, for your detailed overview of the human-driven automation capability that Juniper has to offer. Now I'd like to transition to Alejandro, where he will give us a detailed overview of his automation experience uh, at the Group Bomb. So Alejandro, um, in terms of um, what are the specific problems that you encounter in your network um, due to initial uh, lack of automation? Um, my understanding that uh, at the time you were experiencing rapid growth in the data center. So, how did you overcome this uh, growth challenge? Thanks, Robert. Um, so as you said, we were uh, to rapid data center expansion, and we had multiple problems, which I think resembled most of the network environments when everything is done manually. 
I would summarize this in two categories, like efficiency and consistency. Both share a common cause, using highly skilled people to do repetitive work. When you do this, um, some of the tasks might be uh, fairly short. However, they still require the network engineer to stop working on project work and refocus on another request. And the interruptions and or context switching, if you will, take a toll in efficiency. Um, the other problem is that our deliverables lack consistency. In general, the quality of manual work heavily relies on the skills of the person. The network is, of course, not an exception here. And assuming that all of your team has the expertise to execute on a particular task, the final result will still differ depending on who does it. Some will finish tidy, some will be faster than others, some will make more mistakes than the others, and so on. Um, this undermines your capacity to predict how long it will take to accomplish a task, and also your trust in the final product. So in order to address this problem, we came up with uh, three scripts. It's a very simple solution. One script that allows us to find a host in the network and to, uh, to know what the port settings were. Uh, the second script will change the VLAN in a specific port. And then we came up with a script that mixed both function functionalities. So Alejandro, I'm curious, uh, although Juno supports many uh, different types of off-box lang off languages like uh, Python, Perl, uh, Java, and so on, uh, could you just talk through a little bit your decision to build these scripts around Python? Sure. Um, I agree that as of today, I think the challenge is, is no longer to find the tool to start, but to, to walk the walk of automation. So we chose Python because it allowed us to directly interact with the device instead of going through an agent and its potential limitations. And here I'm thinking not only of provisioning, where many of these toolkits are very good, but in the whole operation of the network, such as pulling operational state, uh, auditing, and so on. Learning a programming language such as Python might take initially more time but I think it pays off in the long run as it serves more purposes and the skills that you gain also remains with you once you stop using a particular framework. Great. Um, have you also, Alejandro, considered other open source um, automation toolkits or scripts? Yes. Um, for some time, I considered moving our code to Ansible. However, Ansible, at that time, used PyEZ underneath, so it was just an interface to what we already had, and it did not add much value to us. Other open source kits are great at consistently handling different platforms. However, this is not where it really hurt to this team, so uh, Python was good enough for our uh, needs at that time. So um, this slide shows what our Server admins got. Right? This is a simple script that will find a host, run some safeguard, and then change the VLAN in a port. Um, over time, the script got more complex and sophisticated, covering more edge cases with some security checks, um, cache layers to push on multiple servers at once, and so on. But in principle, the goal was the same take the network guy out of the loop. Oh, Andre, can you speak a little bit about your experiences with uh, NetComp in particular? Uh, sure. Um, we uh, interact with NetConf uh, interface on Juno's devices through different libraries. Initially, we used uh, NC Client, and now we use PyEZ. Um, having said that, of course, we are not strangers to XML responses. There's times where you need to make a direct call and extract specific data from an XML response, and also when we run unit tests on our PyEZ code, we mock devices, and then we need to save XML responses to prevent calls to notable devices while the tests run. So, 
So this story um, is the trigger that made us use automation to deliver results within the company. Um, Groupon was on a heavy expansion process, and that was taking a toll on the network team. We had uh, three engineers to work on designing and building our first cross-fabric data center, another data center expansion, and also to run uh, the 24-hour operation of the network, like firewalls, load balancers, and the like. Um, no surprisingly, we were in deep trouble. So we decided to code our way out of this problem and to jump into a proof of concept to push configs massively. So this is the recipe that we use for this massive configuration push. Uh, we came up with a uh, a very predictable cabling standard that we can put in, in terms of coding. Um, we use Jinja templates for all the different flavors and configurations that we needed. We created YAML files to pull and push resources. And finally, the glue of all this is code, uh, Python code with uh, using the PyEasy library. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, and I'm just curious to learn a little bit more. Could you elaborate your experience uh, with uh, PyEasy? Uh, sure. Um, as I mentioned before, we initially uh, used the NC client library, but we moved to PyEasy uh, after it became available, and it was a nice change. I think uh, PyEasy provides a nicer structure to work with, and also uh, nice visualization, such as tables. I think we now use PyEasy in most of our code. So our provisioning, our provisioning process was a two-stage provisioning process. Uh, the reason why we split our process in two is because it would allow us to address more cases, such as clustering of different devices. When you cluster devices, some names of uh, interface names and other settings change or are recreated, and therefore you need to cluster them before you can push the final configuration. However, you also have to provision them initially like with operating system and basic settings so they are reachable. Right? Um, so we split our process in first, make the device available and reachable, like put the, all, all the system settings of a Juno S device, basically. Um, upgrade the operating system to, the, to our standard and configure the system settings and make the device available. Users, uh, DNS, SNMP, basic configuration. And the second stage will push all the routing conflicts and the special flavors of this device into uh, the record. Um, the results were uh, very good. Um, e even though our code was far from perfect and did not cover every possible edge case, we had an 80% reduction in provision time. Um, we made a lot of mistakes, but every time we made a mistake, we corrected the code and we pushed everything because now it was a cheap process. So the final result was a huge reduction in configuration mistakes, no human errors. Human errors will, were now code errors that were corrected once each and um, and things were ready uh, with higher quality and in a shorter time span. Alejandro, could you speak a little bit about reducing configuration complexities from things like inline curly bracket style to uh, more simpler human readable formats like YAML? Oh, sure. Um, when, whenever you're uh, pushing configurations or doing automation, and, and this is uh, this is being spoken of uh, several times in different automation talks, you need some sort of some sort of uh, source of truth, right? You need something like a database or something that your code or people can look at and say this is how things should uh, be configured. In, in our case, we chose YAML. Files because um, 
I think they're the sweet spot between a text file and a database. The syntax is very clean. It's easy to read for a person. Uh, uh, an engineer can grab it in a shell or open, open it in any text editor. And at the same time, it has the structure needed to have code reading and writing to it, right? I think YAML provides most of the functionality you, re you require without being intimidating or requiring your network engineers to feel comfortable with a formal database. At some point, I think our YAML files will become a database, but that's not where it hurts today, so that can certainly wait. So one part of the um, provisioning process is to push your conflicts, but then you still have a fair amount of work ending in verifying that everything you push is correctly uh, is working as you expect. So the second part of this initiative uh, made us write code to audit the devices, right? So we'll log into the device, um, retrieve the operational status, re retrieve configurations, and uh, at the same time, we'll look at our source of truth and cross these two sources of data and verify that it was correctly configured and that the operational status like ports, uh, operating system versions, licenses, uh, the IP allocations, VLANs, the BGP peers, and so on, were all in place as they should be. To give you a more concrete view of how this looked like, uh, this is an example. Right? It, it was just another script, um, and the script will uh, load all the information we had in a source of truth for this device, and then it will log into the device and check various things. So here you can check that um, this device is a bit or chassis, so it checks that both members have the same operating system version, that FPC0 is um, it's a top, top or back switches. Um, the RE0 is the master. It, it checks for uh, the Bitcoin chassis ports to be configured and up. Uh, licenses, IP allocations. Uh, it audits the billion configuration. If, if there's um, aggregating protocols configured on the device, it will check those uh, bonding ports as well for, for the health. And, well, as you can see, it's a little bit verbose. So, and, and even though you might be interested in these details, you are, uh, at the end of the day, if you're auditing several devices, you're auditing, you're interested in the result. So the auditing script also had a summary view of the results for one or more devices. If you're only interested in, in the outcome and not really interested in every check that the script has run, you could just look at these tables at the end. What we have in this slide is uh, two examples. So um, I'm running this on two different uh, server switches. switches. Um, the, the, the one on the top has uh, an error because the LDP names don't match with the description of the ports. So that probably hints that there's a, a, a shifted port. And we can, and, and just going a little bit back, we can fully trust in the descriptions and LDP of this device because they were pushed with code. Right. And, and remember, we had a predictable cabling standard. So we know exactly where this port should be connected to. Uh, it, this, the top switch also has a couple of warnings because the screen was unable to get um, the configuration for a, for a couple of interfaces. But this is okay because this switch did not have so many uplinks. Um, so it's just a warning. The, the case at the bottom is, is similar. It just shows different sort of errors, like oh, you're missing the licenses on this device, um, there's one interface down that should not be down, and you have a, a, an LACP board that is not looking good. It's not uh, distributing, uh, collecting distributing. And here's an example of how it looks when it's all good, right? Status is okay, this is a spine of our cloth fabric, no errors, only warnings that some interfaces have no conflict, and that's okay in this case because uh, this uh, spine that did not connect to so many leads. So this story builds on top of the two, uh, on the previous ones, right? Uh, we were, at this point, gathering information programmatically, 
from the network devices, and we were also pushing configurations. Uh, we had written code to check on different things, and we also populated our source of truth, which was slowly replacing all the scattered documents we had until then. So again, we looked, like, where are we spending our time? Uh, where, is, where does it hurt? In which, in which processes are we the bottleneck? And two things came out of that. One was the firewall management. Firewall management was consuming a fair amount of the team's time. And the other was um, that the information we were able to gather from network devices and our source of truth was not only useful for the network team, but also to other teams. Um, so if we could offer an easy-to-consume format for it, that seemed to be a big gain. Um, so we thought about this, like, okay, how do we publish our information? Unfortunately, we are surrounded by an army of developers, right? So uh, we didn't need to look very far. What do they do? What do these guys do when they have to share information and communicate with each other? And the answer is REST. They use REST interface. So with this in mind, uh, we decided to publish the functionality of our code, of the code we already had, and the, uh, not the information in our source of truth by a REST to the rest of the engineering team. And we also look forward to start building small blocks towards automating our firewalls. So what you see here is the same find host, find a host functionality that we scripted in the first story of this webinar, now behind a REST API. So you can see that um, the answer could be richer, and now it's a JSON response, so it's a consumable format. In this other example, we are slowly starting to address the firewall automation box. So um, as you might know, with Juniper Firewalls, uh, interfaces are mapped to security zones, and, and you can have a different host and, and, and different security zones. So here we are querying using REST uh, which security zone a particular destination belongs to. And you can see in the answer, we get this, uh, this destination belongs to specific color. This is the destination. This is the actual match, which might or might not uh, be a perfect match for your destination. You, you could be asking for a particular host, and you might, the match could be a, uh, an entire subnet. And it tells you which interface it maps to um, and what, what the security zone name that it belongs to. Continuing with the firewall automation blocks, uh, here you can see a REST call to ask if a particular flow is allowed um, through the firewall. So uh, I'll stop 13 on 420. And the res response is yes. Um, these are the zones for the source and the destination, and this is the policy name that allows this traffic. And moreover, if you're curious about what this policy NetOps-999 has inside, you can also call our REST API and ask the firewall what this policy, uh, how this policy is configured. So then, in this example, you have the full policy uh, converted in JSON, so you can parse it and do it on, uh, use it for other purposes, right? Um, you could, for example, have another engineering team asking, before they, they create a firewall ticket, they could uh, query your REST API and check whether the flow they need is already allowed. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, really appreciate your detailed overview of your network automation experience. Um, in turn, uh, my understanding is that uh, you're also in the process of automating your firewall. So um, we're looking forward to have you come back here in, in the next time, in the near future, to share with us your firewall automation experience. 
thanks Nathan and Robert. And yeah, uh, we're we're wrapping up with our firewall automation. So uh, I'd be happy to to share it once we're we're done with it. And so yeah, looking forward to to the next webinar. Thank you. Great stuff. So Alejandro, thank you for sharing that. Um, that's obviously quite sophisticated. Uh, you've really touched on a lot of things, there, like PyEasy, uh, YAML, some JSON things. Uh, very, very interesting stuff. Um, can you go ahead and just tell us what other tools you kind of see coming down the pipe, uh, or what other things you're kind of investigating to implement, uh, you know, the next six months or so? Uh, sure. Um, as of today, we're finishing our firewall automation, which should liberate resources and provide system handling of those tasks. Uh, having addressed uh, our repetitive task and the time-consuming activities, I, I would like to focus on group on operational processes, like integrating our code with the other teams, um, as having code that assists us in troubleshooting or verify changes, um, running permanent audits, or detecting anomalies. Yeah, that's all great stuff, and it really sounds like it's uh, it's going to lead you guys well right into the event-driven automation stuff, or kind of the day two kind of things. Uh, for co collaboration between teams, have you considered using uh, some source control tools like SVN or Git? Oh yeah, um, we use Git uh, intensively, like for code, for data, for backup, for um, for lunch and for dinner. Awesome. So also, uh, do you guys still maintain, or could you at least speak to what mm -hmm. level that you guys maintain human control over actually deploying these changes in production and what that process looks like a little bit? Uh, yes. Um, production is our top priority. And as such, uh, it is not one of my current goals to have not to have human control over them. Um, I expect every change to be under human control, which does not mean it's being manually pushed. Let's make that distinction. Um, this is what I previously meant with moving our focus to the operational processes. A person deploys changes using some tool that guarantees consistency. On the other hand, testing changes before they go to production and verifying them after they are pushed, those are, in my view, great targets for full automation. Let the system tell you if it's healthy. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, final question here uh, for, for this portion. Um, for the corner cases that come up where you actually have to physically or manually go in and implement some configuration change, uh, do you guys still have those uh, corner cases that come up where you do find yourself on the CLI? Uh, and if so, how do you kind of reconcile that with uh, some of the, you know, uh, other uh, human-driven automation that you have there? Um, yes, we do have corner cases. Um, there's different sections of the network, right? And unless there's on an ongoing debugging, leaks and spines in our cross fabric are no longer manually modified by our team. Uh, if, there's a, if, if there's a change needed, we regenerate the entire config and push it again. Um, there's other sections of the network, however, that are more of a one-off, like um, parts where we connect with providers or these kind of things, and manual changes still happen there. Um, automation, I love automation. Automation is cool, but not everything is a target for automation. You, you automate where it hurts. Like if, if it's too much of a one-off, I'm fine with having uh, manual changes there. Well said. Alejandro shared with us three interesting stories as he and his team at Groupon embark on their automation journey. There are a number of lessons that can be drawn from these stories. First, automation often starts as small as an experiment when disruption occurs. In the case of Groupon, the disruption occurred when Alejandro realized that they needed an efficient way to configure multiple network devices during rapid expansion. Second, along the line of starting small, 
Automation is about delivering gradual results, eventually leading to significant gain in efficiency and agility. Thanks to automation, Groupon has experienced a reduction of device provision time by over 80% while significantly reducing human error. Third, automation is about change. It's about taking a new collaborative approach to accomplish tasks that require change both from a technology as well as a cultural standpoint. Fourth, share. Alejandro has actively shared his automation experience both internally within Groupon, but as well as with us today to foster collaboration and learning experience. Last, automation is a journey. It's a gradual step-by-step -step process. Juniper Networks, with our proven automation capability complemented by an open, extensible technology platform, will guide you at every stage of automation and to embark on a journey toward a self-driving network together. I hope you found this webinar informative. To learn more about Juniper's automation capability and our different use cases, please visit juniper.net. Thank you, and have a great day.